on World News Tonight. Bangladesh ablaze. Rohingya refugees run for safety following a deadly fire outbreak that ripped through the camps. Fatal floods. Malaysia struggles to stay afloat as torrential rain forces thousands to flee their homes. Humble hopes. China's National People's Congress kicks off with setting growth targets well within their means. And pyrotechnic flair. Fireworks light up Mexico's skies yet again in a week-long celebration. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and you are joining us on World News. Now leading tonight is Bangladesh investigating a huge fire at the world's largest refugee camp which has left 12,000 people without shelter. No casualties have been reported but the blaze raised 2,000 shelters after spreading quickly through gas cylinders in kitchens. The blaze erupted at Camp 11 in Cox's Bazar, a southeastern border district where more than a million Rohingya refugees live. Most of the refugees fled a military-led crackdown in Myanmar in 2017, and the fire left some of them homeless yet again. Authorities are working with international and local humanitarian organizations to provide food and temporary shelters to those who have lost homes. The UN's International Organization of Migration in Bangladesh said on social media that they are assessing the needs of the people to provide support. Sunday's blaze marks one of the largest of several fires that have plagued the camp in recent years. From Hetmar Nessa and her five-year-old daughter Ume Salima in Akhe province in Indonesia and before in Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh. An estimated one million members of the stateless Muslim minority Rohingya live in what many consider to be among the world's largest refugee camps after fleeing a brutal campaign of killing and arson by the Myanmar military. Now, over in neighboring India, Indian firefighters are trying to put out a fire at a waste plant which has led to a toxic smoke cover over many areas in Kochi city in Kerala state. The fire began last week at a local waste management plant which processes tons of waste every day. Residents have been advised to remain indoors and use N95 masks if they step out. Local authorities have also announced that schools will be shut for younger children. Locals have protested earlier against the fires and the alleged health hazard caused by the burning of plastic here. It's not clear yet what led to the latest fire. A firefighter told the Press Trust of India that layers of plastic had heated up underneath the mounds of waste, delaying the operation. The smoke generated by the fire was also causing nausea and dizziness among the firefighters. At least 20 officials from the fire department had developed breathing issues from the exposure to the toxic smoke. The state's health minister, Veena George, has advised elderly people, children, pregnant women and those with respiratory issues to avoid exposure to the smoke. The city police have launched an investigation into the fire. The state's pollution control board has issued a notice to local authorities asking them to pay 18 million Indian rupees as penalty for failing to follow waste management rules. Pakistani police served arrest warrants to former Prime Minister Imran Khan to ensure his appearance in court on charges of misusing his office to sell state gifts after Khan's supporters tried to prevent police entry into his home. The Election Commission of Pakistan had in October found the 70-year-old cricket hero turned politician guilty of unlawfully selling gifts from foreign dignitaries. The Federal Investigation Agency then filed charges against him in an anti-graph court, which last week issued the arrest warrants after Khan failed to appear in court despite repeated summons. Khan has been demanding a snap election since his ouster from office and parliamentary vote early last year, a demand that was rejected by his successor Shabazz Sharif, who has said the vote would be held as scheduled later this year. Former PM Khan led countrywide protest campaigns to press for an early vote last year and was shot and wounded at one of the rallies. Referring to his absence from court, the shooting incident, Khan said, they know there is a threat against my life, adding the courts did not provide adequate securities. Khan's aide Fawad Chowdhury said he could not be arrested because he secured a protective bail from a high court. Khan is required to appear in court tomorrow. If he fails to do so, police will be required to arrest him and present him to court. Flooding resulting from days of torrential rain has forced almost 40,000 people to flee their homes in Malaysia's southern Johor state, bordering Singapore, and at least four people have died during the past week. Now, for more details, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Nevami Ranasinghe, joining us now from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Nevami? Yes, Sanuradi, a cleanup is underway in parts of Malaysia. 
after days of rain triggered flooding forced thousands from their homes and killed at least four people. Nearly 50,000 people had been affected by the floods as of today morning. The worst affected area was Johor, the southern state neighbouring Singapore. Pictures shared on social media showed belongings and furniture piled on the side of the road as people began cleaning up homes. Police said an elderly couple who drowned were amongst those who died. In the town of Yongpen, one of the worst hit areas, a family waded through brown waters outside their home with their children using inner tubes as floats. Floods are not unusual during the annual monsoon season, which usually takes place between November and March. But in recent years, Malaysia has endured a series of severe floods, which experts say are the result of overdevelopment, deforestation and the changing climate. Heavy rain cut off the town of Segamat, also in Johor, in December 2006, while thousands of people in the northeastern states were hit by floods in December 2014 that submerged the main highway connecting the east and west coasts of the country. The capital, Kuala Lumpur, Shah Alam and Klang have also seen major floods in the past with 27 people killed in December 2021. Even as the cleanup begins, Malaysia's meteorologists are warning that more rain is likely in the coming days. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was Other Day on the World News Special Correspondent Nivami Rana Singh, her reporting from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. China's National People's Congress has kicked off its annual parliamentary session, announcing a modest target for economic growth of about 5%. The session, which began in Beijing, is also set to hand President Xi Jinping a third term in office and implement the biggest government shakeup in a decade. China on Sunday set a modest 5% target for its economic growth this year as it kicked off the annual session of its National People's Congress. This year's NPC is poised to implement the biggest government shake-up in a decade. That's after gross domestic product grew by just 3% last year, one of the economy's weakest performances in decades. It has been squeezed by three years of Covid controls, a crisis in the vast property sector and a crackdown on private enterprise. Premier Li Keqiang stressed the need for economic stability and expanding consumption. The main projected targets for development this year are as follows. GDP growth of around 5%, around 12 million new urban jobs. Surveyed urban unemployment rate of around 5.5%. Lee warned that global inflation remains high, global economic and trade growth is losing steam and that external efforts to suppress and contain China are escalating. Among the many challenges faced by Beijing is an increasingly fraught relationship with the United States, which is trying to block its access to cutting-edge technology. The demographic outlook is also worsening with plunging birth rates and a population drop last year, the first since the famine in 1961. In a work report released on Sunday, the nation's state planner said China plans to lower the costs of childbirth, childcare and education. On Taiwan, Li struck a moderate tone, saying China should promote the peaceful development of relations and advance the process of China's peaceful reunification. But he also said resolute steps should be taken to oppose Taiwan's independence. 67-year-old Li and other more reform-oriented officials are set to retire during the Congress. They're making way for loyalists to President Xi Jinping, who further tightened his grip on power when he secured a third leadership term at October's Communist Party Congress. Long-time Xi ally Li Qiang is expected to be confirmed as Premier during the NPC. The rubber stamp parliament will also discuss Xi's plans for an intensive and wide-ranging reorganization of state and communist party entities, state media reported on Tuesday. Analysts expect a further deepening of communist party penetration of state bodies. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. 
South Korea's government has announced a plan to resolve a long-running dispute on compensating people who were forced to work in Japanese factories and mines during World War II. Foreign Minister Park Jin announced that the South Korean government will compensate the victims using funds procured through a third party, a public foundation called the Foundation of Victims of Forced Mobilization by Imperial Japan. He said the foundation will pay the compensation and the interest on the delayed payment to the plaintiffs of the final ruling made in 2018, and that the same foundation will also cover the compensation and interest for the plaintiffs of pending cases if the court ruling in their favor. Over four years ago, South Korea's Supreme Court made landmark rulings ordering two Japanese companies, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries and Nippon Steel, to compensate 15 Korean victims of forced labor during Japanese colonial rule. Seoul's foreign ministry explained that the government came up with the solution as its priority is to arrange the payments as soon as possible as many victims have already passed away or in their 90s. It is also said that the solution is aimed at improving relations between the two countries, which have been strained since 2019, when the Japanese government implemented export restrictions. Korean businesses that were beneficiaries of the 1965 treaty that normalized bilateral ties, including POSCO, will be making contributions to the foundation. The Korean government says that it has left the door open, though, for Japanese corporations to take part in the future, but it's likely that the Japanese firms will not be making contributions to the foundation, insisting all matters were settled under the 1965 treaty. So the victims and the civic groups supporting them have been protesting against the government's plan, saying that this issue cannot be resolved without sincere apologies and participation from the Japanese companies. We have some good news for you. UN member states have finally agreed to a text on the first international treaty to protect the high seas, a fragile and vital treasure that covers nearly half the planet. After years of negotiations, negotiations from more than 100 countries completed the UN treaty, a long-awaited step that environmental groups say will help reverse marine biodiversity losses and ensure sustainable development. Negotiators from more than 100 countries completed a UN treaty late on Saturday, aimed at protecting the high seas. It's a long-awaited step that environmental groups say will help reverse marine biodiversity loss. Very little of the high seas, which are outside national jurisdictions, are subject to any protection. Pollution, acidification and overfishing pose a growing threat. The legally binding pact to conserve and ensure the sustainable use of ocean biodiversity has been under discussion for 15 years. Good evening, ish. This is UN Conference President Rena Lee at the end of a marathon day of talks. The ship has reached the shore. Economic interests had been a major sticking point throughout the latest round of negotiations. Developing countries were calling for a greater share of the spoils from the blue economy, including the transfer of technology. The treaty is seen as a crucial component in global efforts to bring 30% of the world's land and sea under protection by the end of the decade. Greenpeace says 4.2 million square miles of ocean needs to be put under protection every year to meet the target, which is known as 30 by 30. Laura Mella, a Greenpeace Oceans campaigner who attended the talks, said countries need to formally adopt and ratify the treaty as quickly as possible to bring it into force. And then deliver the fully protected ocean sanctuaries our planet needs. Former US President Donald Trump closed out the annual conference of conservative leaders by airing grievances aplenty and promising only he can save America from becoming a, quote, filthy communist nightmare by getting rid of the deep state and overturning President Joe Biden's policies if he gets a second chance in the nation's highest office. Former US President Donald Trump, who is again seeking the White House as a Republican, spoke at the Conservative Political Action Conference in Washington this weekend and made clear that his message was the future of Republican politics in America. We had a Republican Party that was ruled by freaks, neocons, globalists, open border zealots, and fools. But we are never going back to the party of Paul Ryan, Karl Rove, and Jeb Bush. 
Trump could assail the Republican Party's former leaders and luminaries with impunity at CPAC because at CPAC almost everything was Trump. His face flashed on tank tops and lettered t-shirts, twinkled on rings and bedazzled high heels. Supporters could show their commitment to his MAGA agenda on hats and their loyalty on stickers. The speakers included some of Trump's most loyal allies in Congress, including far-right Republican representatives Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, and Lauren Bobbert. Some were recent election losers turned election deniers, such as Arizona Republican gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake. They stole that election. The entire world saw it. And Brazil's former president Jair Bolsonaro. Trump wasn't even the only speaker named Trump. We need a president that is not owned by other people. There was his son, Donald Trump Jr., and his daughter-in-law, Laura Trump. In the run-up to an election year, CPAC typically showcases rival Republican candidates, but so far only former South Carolina governor and UN ambassador Nikki Haley has declared her intentions to challenge the 45th president. This is my purpose. This is our mission. Let's save our country from weakness and wokeness. Let's bring back a nation that's strong and proud. Haley and former U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, another potential presidential candidate, received polite, if tepid, responses from the crowd. Haley was met with chants of Trump in the hallway outside the ballroom where she gave her speech. CPAC once was the premier gathering of the party's Republicans in Washington. It was skipped this year by most Republican members of Congress and the nation's Republican governors. Many speakers spoke to a half-empty ballroom, and attendance overall seemed noticeably lower than in years past. And you're going to have World War III, by the way. You're going to have World War III. If something doesn't happen fast, you're going to have World War III. Trump, in his remarks closing the event Saturday night, offered a dark vision of decay and violence if he wasn't re-elected in 2024. But we have no choice. If we don't do this, our country will be lost forever and offering a promise of restoration and revenge if he wins. I am your warrior. I am your justice. And for those who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. I am your retribution. Not going to let this happen. A Greek railway employee has been jailed pending trial over a train crash that killed at least 57 people. The 59-year-old man's detention on Sunday came as clashes erupted between police and protesters in the Greek capital, Athens. Grief turned to anger as thousands gathered in Athens' main square to demand accountability for Tuesday's deadly train wreck. The 12,000-strong crowd released hundreds of black balloons into the sky in honor of those killed in the crash. Carrying signs saying murderers, demonstrators have accused the government of allowing companies to put profits above human lives. Despite the continuous warnings by workers, there was criminal indifference by those responsible to our requests over the safety systems, and that's what led to this tragic accident. Clashes broke out in the square after some protesters set fire to garbage bins and threw Molotov cocktails. In response, police fired tear gas and stun grenades. The government has blamed human error for the crash, while the prime minister has asked forgiveness from the victims' families. He's vowed Greece will soon reform its railway system. Members of the opposition have called for a thorough investigation. We have a duty, especially towards the victims, to explain to the public exactly what happened. Of course, we don't think this is the fault of any one individual. We think the government shares the responsibility. Meanwhile, the station master in Larissa has appeared in court. He admitted responsibility for the accident and has been charged with endangering lives and disrupting public transport. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Parts of Australia's east, including Sydney, recorded their hottest day in more than two years today with temperatures hitting more than 40 degrees Celsius. 
Max Verstappen and Red Bull made a dream start to the Formula 1 season with a dominant 1-2 in Bahrain. Mexican Sergio Perez finished runner-up a distant 11.9 seconds behind his double world champion teammate as Red Bull celebrated their 10th win in 12 races stretching back to last July. Liverpool bought Manchester United's bandwagon as stuttering halt as Cody Gakpo, Darwin Nunes and Mohamed Salah all scored twice in a record 7-0, hammering up their arch rivals to boost their Premier League top four hopes at Anfield. Germany Scholz welcomes the EU Commission President von der Leyen to German Cabinet meeting. Scholz called for the country to be confident about modernizing its society and economy ahead of a two-day cabinet meeting that will tackle topics including climate policy, war in Ukraine and digitization. Taiwan Defense Minister Shui Sheng warned that the island has to be on alert this year for sudden entry by the Chinese military into areas close to its territory amid rising military tensions across the Taiwan Strait. Taiwan has vowed to exercise its rights to self-defense and counter-attack if Chinese armed forces entered its territory. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the entire program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. And finally, we leave you tonight with colorful firework displays that lit up the Mexican night skies during Tultepec's annual firework festival. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.